mean, people love turtles, so. <laughs> I started it. I did a little bit of a Sea Turtle 101 at the beginning. Perfect. And then that segued into... Yeah, like, don't let coyotes eat turtles. Yeah, you really snag them with the baby turtles. And then, how were those greats? They were... Should have gone to the talk. <laughs> Hey Paul, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, there, there's no, nobody else here from the board, right? I don't know. I don't think I don't, so. I didn't see anybody, but I also know that there have been new members, and I just wanted to make sure that I don't not mention anyone. Nope. This, okay. You good? Okay. All right. You want to go? Let's see. What we at? We at? Yeah. Why not? It's yeah. It's eight fifty nine. We'll get started. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Thank you guys all for coming out. My name is Marissa. I'm the Environmental Education Manager here at Cape Fear River Watch. Uh, and it is a beautiful morning to be talking about birds. So thank you all for joining. Um, I'm going to go ahead and remind you, uh, share some reminders and updates about Cape Fear River Watch events and programs that are coming up. Uh, and then I will turn it over to our speaker today. Um, so we have next week our second Saturday cleanup. Um, we still have not um, decided on a location yet. Um, so um, Rob, our water quality programs manager, just recently had a little baby. And so we're very happy and, and excited for him. Uh, and so he's been off for a little bit. But he'll be returning to work next week. And we will be promoting that location when we know it. Um, after the second Saturday paddle, or after our second Saturday cleanup, we have our third Saturday paddle. That'll be in two weeks from today. Um, we will be going to Rice Creek, which is over in Brunswick County. Um, we do have all of our kayaks rented um, for our, our members, um, but if you have your own um, kayak and you'd like to join us, um, we would love to have you out there. Um, you can speak with me um, or Shauna right here in the front um, after our seminar if you want more information or if you want to get registered for that. Um, the following week, we will be having, well, we will be partnering um, to film, uh, to have a screening of the film Burned, which if you came to State of the River this year, we did um, a film screening of that, um, that documentary at that event. Um, but we'll have another screening at Django's Playhouse on Friday, September 22nd. Um, and Dana will be there and she'll be speaking about um, the issue of PFAS and firefighters. Um, so it's a really great film. If you haven't seen it already, I encourage you to go out on Friday, September 22nd. The day after, on Saturday, September 23rd, we have our big annual Lake Fest event, which is out at Greenfield Lake. It's a very family-friendly event. We will have games and crafts and activities and local organizations out tabling, um, paddle boat rides, nature tours, all sorts of fun. Um, so please join us, bring family, bring friends, enjoy a day out. Hopefully we'll have beautiful weather like today. Um, and share with all of your contacts if you have other folks that would enjoy that. Um, I just want to do a quick shout out to our board member in the crowd, Paul Smith, if you could just raise your hand. We appreciate you coming and helping and we always are looking for other volunteers um, to serve on our board and in volunteer capacities. So um, that's something you can explore if you're interested. Um, a reminder that we have a donation jar out front. If you're feeling so inclined, we would love to have a few dollars um, to donate that helps us to support the programs like this, to offer free pancakes and coffee and have seminar speakers come out. Um, and then our membership raffle ended yesterday for the summer, um, and we will be announcing our membership raffle winner. Um, that person will get to go on either a, t a boat trip with Kemp, our riverkeeper, or um, a private tour, guided tour of the Three Sisters Swamp with Cape Fear River Adventures. So um, we're still waiting on some of our mailing, our mailed renewals to come in, but next week we will be announcing our, our winner for that. So those are all of my announcements. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, Evan. So Evan Bucklin is the managing director at Cape Fear Bird Observatory. She's a passionate local birder. She has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies and a Master of Science in Marine Biology from the University of North Carolina Wilmington. She's worked for the National Park Service and Audubon, North Carolina, monitoring coastal species of concern and has been a volunteer for several local and state agencies and nonprofit organizations monitoring birds and doing educational outreach. And we're very, very excited to have her here this morning. So I'm going to turn it on over to you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, 
guys. I'm really excited to talk to you today about the Cape Fear Bird Observatory. Um, we are a pretty new organization in town. Oh, what? Oh, there we go. We yes. Go. Sorry, we're, there we More go. More is better. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're pretty new. Uh, we were just um, founded in 2020. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about where we started, where we hope to go, and where we're at right now. So I want to talk a little bit about my background. Um, I was a college dropout, and then I went to our wonderful Cape Fear Community College, um, and then off to UNCW in that two-year program at Cape Fear and then jump over. It's uh, really awesome. If you have any young people in your life, strongly encourage. I loved Cape Fear. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, too many, too many. Uh, <laughs> while I was at UNCW, I met some people up in Raleigh who do bird banding and research at the Museum of Natural Sciences. So one of my internships before I graduated with my undergrad was for the Smithsonian Institution. Um, helping with a program called Neighborhood Nest Watch. Anybody familiar? <laughs> CJ. <laughs> um, but yeah, Neighborhood Nest Watch is a really cool program um, in lots of urban hubs. Uh, they do bird banding sort of in like the urban to rural gradient. So I was helping in like the greater Chapel Hill area, going to people's yards, banding their birds. We had eight target species and we would really just talk to them about what they were seeing and um, gathering important data about uh, presence, absence of some of these like migrant versus resident species. I graduated UNCW and then went to work for the Park Service, which was super fun. I worked up at Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Has anybody ever been? Yay! <laughs> it's a great place. Um, I was a biologist there. We monitored um, nesting shorebirds, uh, beach nesting birds like least terns, and um, sea turtles. So that was really fun. I went back to UNCW for my master's degree, um, as we talked about in the bio. <laughs> and uh, I studied seaside and salt marsh sparrows there in um, the marshes just along the coast here. Um, after that, I went back to the Park Service. Ah, there we go, for a hot minute. And <laughs> then um, sort of while I was still working there, um, we founded the Cape Fair Bird Observatory. Um, the first couple years that we were working, everybody that worked for the observatory was also, like, was just volunteering. We started as volunteers, so we were fitting it in our free time. And last summer, I was working for um, Audubon, North Carolina, here along the coast as well, which was a wonderful experience, but didn't make it onto my slide. So, you guys might not know what a bird observatory is. Has anyone heard of a bird observatory before? Okay, a smattering of people. So a bird observatory is like a center where we just focus on birds. We look at their populations, their migrations, their um, health. Um, usually small organizations, usually focused on local birds. But as you know, birds are uh, always moving around. So the work can span many states or many countries or have collaborators sort of all around the globe. Uh, right now, we're very small scale here. So we're just kind of focused on our Cape Fear region birds, but uh, over time, maybe we'll do more. So I thought in introducing observatories, I would talk to you about other notable bird observatories. So we're not a weird organization. There are lots of us, lots of precedent. Um, this isn't even all of them. This is just like some that are, you know, they've been going along for a long time. Uh, most of these bird observatories function like each one kind of does its own thing in its own way, but all of them kind of are similar. We all are going to be looking at migration. Almost every bird observatory does migration banding and then some regional species work. Some observatories are um, collaborations with local universities. Others are completely independent. Um, it really just runs the gambit. So um, all these bird observatories, uh, many of them have existed for decades and decades, all collecting data that all gets sent to like a central federal database. And through that enormous amount of data, really important discoveries have come up with observatories collaborating with each other or just researchers working with that huge data set. 
So I've got two prizes here, two observatory stickers. If anyone can identify, okay, so for the first one, who can identify this guy? Close, close. It is a warbler. That one's a really tricky one, so <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> um, anybody got this one right here? Where our bird is at? No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. CJ, I know you know. Well, you already got a sticker, so whatever. All right. Well, we'll, we'll do more of a quiz later. But this guy here is a black pole warbler. Hard to tell because he's in his fall plumage, non-breeding. And then this one here, his name is right in his plumage. He's a black-throated blue warbler. This is the male. The female does not look like that. Um, so researchers were able to uh, look into some information about black pole warblers based off of 60 years worth of banding data across the country. They looked at over 15,000 um, black pole warblers and found really interesting things about their migration. Um, the population splits their migration and the birds that go farther have a longer wing morphology. They also found that males and females migrate at different times. Um, all really super interesting stuff that you wouldn't really be able to do without the hard work of bird observatories. For black-throated blue warblers, they found that their um, migration phenology, so the timing of their migration, uh, drastically changed over decades. This was a 50-year study, or 50 years of data, and they found that males and females also migrated differently in that group. Super cool stuff. So our plans for the Cape Fear Bird Observatory, how do we see ourselves fitting into this map of amazing organizations doing amazing work? We've got some long-term goals. So we want to, of course, be working on some long-term data collection, just like our fellow observatories. We really want to see greater environmental awareness and engagement in the Cape Fear area. I know we're talking to a perfect audience for that, because that's what all of you want, too. Um, we are sort of standing on the shoulders of giants in doing that because we have a lot of environmental organizations in the Cape Fear region that are already working on that crusade. We want to see some greater diversity in the field of avian ecology in the Cape Fear region. Um, there are a lot of historically excluded groups from biology, the biological sciences, and so we'd like to do some work to um, help change that. We want a property with a facility one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'd really like to see ourselves with our own property where we can have an education building. Uh, if you know anybody. <laughs> um, we'd love the ability to provide housing to visiting researchers and interns for us and other organizations. A huge problem in the conservation work that gets done in this region is housing for seasonal employees. So. Our organizations locally have a difficult time paying enough money to get someone to live here for six months, three months, when the rent is astronomical and it's so hard to get a lease for that short period of time. So something that we've been kind of working on behind the scenes, <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> is um, trying to find somebody who wants to like get rid of an old apartment building that they don't want to take care of anymore without selling it to Airbnb <laughs> or leaving it to their children or selling it for property. Um, it is a pipe dream, potentially, but you know what? We're going to keep trying. Um, and then we'd also like to be a consistent, regionally important avian research training program. Over the years, we'd like to help UNCW students come and do their research projects through our organization. We'd also like to have um, visiting fellows come and do some work, share our data with graduate students, and just kind of make it uh, a great hub for avian research. And then lastly, we need an endowment. One day, <laughs> a lot of these things are long-term goals, of course. We just started in 2020. We have many years to be working on this project, many years to be reaching these goals. Which brings us to our current work. So how exactly are we working towards these goals? Today, we will be discussing our migration banding, painted buntings, hummingbirds, outreach and education, and then upcoming projects. These top four things are kind of like our main programmatic endeavors. There are pillars to our institution. And then our upcoming projects are where we'll be spending some of our energy in the next year. 
So for migration banding, um, I thought maybe we could start out by talking about what is bird banding in general. So how many of you guys have heard of bird banding, participated in bird banding? Yeah, okay, great. You guys already know. <laughs> Um, so bird banding is a really simple way to um, track individual birds. There are lots of different ways that you can use this to answer your research questions. Um, for our migration banding, um, it's more of like a long-term effort. So any recaps, that's like when we catch a bird again after it's been banded, that's fantastic. If we catch a bird from someone else's banding station, that's amazing. Um, and then for our painted buntings, um, it's a little bit of a, a quicker track. So we do color bands on them, and those bands um, can identify an individual bird down to the individual level. So uh, are any of you guys in like the um, Cape Fear Birding Group? Well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Cape Fear Birding Group. It's like a Facebook group of people who take oh, photos. Oh, I thought you were talking about the um, Carolina Bird Club or something. Mm, yes, them too. but. Their communication is different. But the Cape Fear Birding Group is just a Facebook group where people take a lot of photos and then share them. And uh, we've been seeing a ton of our Airly Gardens buntings getting posted on there. So that's really important information. We don't have to go bother that bird again. It just gets photographed and we're like, hey, that's Frank. We banded him in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really helpful. For the migration birds, if we catch them when they're going down from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds in the fall, and then we catch them again in the spring when they're coming back up, that's amazing. That means that bird went all the way down to Central America or South America and then is going back up to Boreal Canada. That's outstanding. If, I mean, you know, we don't always get that data, but when we do, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> we um, attach these little leg bands here um, each one of those carries an individual number. And then all that data gets put into a federal database um, with the US Geological Society. And it's pretty cool. We can also tell things like how long a bird lives. We can tell um, when they start nesting. We can tell who they migrate with, whether they migrate um, in hops and spurts or whether they just go straight on down. And depending on like what kind of data sets you're looking at or who you're working with, you can find out about like population trends among birds. Um, it's really a wonderful tool uh, that's minimally invasive and um, been a longstanding way to collect important data on birds. Um, so these are some of our little friends that we have collected, uh, <laughs> collected during our fall and spring migrations. Um, okay, we still have our two stickers. <laughs> Can anyone tell me who this is? Close, close, similarly plumaged. Not quite. Who said black and white? <laughs> Nancy! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> One of our prizes is out. <laughs> Does anyone recognize any of these other species up here? Cuckoo. Who said cuckoo? Nice. Excellent work. Yellow-billed cuckoo right there. <laughs> Yes, yes. I mean, it's a dim picture, so, you know, totally fair. <laughs> uh, no. No mockingbirds. Sorry to say. Um, so we have, I can see it better on here. We've got a wood thrush. We have um, a uh, blue-gray gnatcatcher, black-throated black blue warbler female, American redstart, swamp sparrow, gray cheek thrush, white-eyed vireo, yellow-billed cuckoo, black and white warbler, and uh, Louisiana water thrush. Yeah, and these are all birds that migrate different distances. They spend different amounts of time in North Carolina, and um, it's really interesting to see who comes through. This is our effort in collecting long-term data as part of our goals, and 
we live in an area that is poised to experience a lot of change in the coming decades. So we think this is, if it had been started before, it would have been great, but now seems like a great time to start doing this kind of data collection. We want to be able to monitor over time what kinds of trends we see in migration. Are there different species assemblages, different groups of kinds of birds that come through as we start to experience greater development? I mean, we can still put a lot of car washes in this town. And then we're definitely going to be experiencing uh, some climate change effects, some sea level rise, and how is that going to impact the birds that are migrating through here? That's something that we hope to see over time. <coughs> Painted buntings um, is how I've spent my entire summer, so I'm going to talk about this one probably more than the others. Um, painted bunting demographics is really fun. Um, we've been doing painted bunting since before we were an observatory. Um, our collaborators at the um, North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences up in Raleigh were doing educational bird banding at Airlie Gardens and Carolina Beach State Park for many years. And then in 2021, we kind of took over the project from them, still working with them, but now we have this organization, so we have the opportunity to do a little bit more work. And so we're asking some deeper questions, still doing the educational outreach through this, but also like looking into um, occupancy, so where the birds are. And in the future, we hope to be looking at um, some other things about them. Painted buntings are a species of concern in North Carolina. Their greatest threats are from climate change, human development, invasive species, habitat modifications, and um, climate change effects. They like to live in um, that scrubby, shrubby area, sort of like along the coast. You can really usually, in North Carolina at least, find them within like a mile of the water. But in South Carolina, they go in a lot deeper. So that's something we're kind of curious about. Um, we also want to look at their nest success. There's not really a lot of data about um, painted bunting nest success or fledgling success. So once the birds leave the nest, what happens? Are they like wildly successful? Do they fail all the time? Is everyone eaten by snakes? We don't know. And so we want to find out. We're also really curious about um, painted buntings over the winter. You can see this sort of blown out but zoomed in area of the map. We're really only supposed to have buntings during the summertime when they're breeding. Um, but take that with a grain of salt. Most range maps of species are very far outdated. Um, painted buntings is no exception. So we have lots of wintering buntings. We have buntings that stay here every winter, and the number of those is growing every year. So that's something we're also interested in. This past year, we uh, banded some painted buntings that wintered in Carteret County and then also down here in New Hanover County. And we're just putting feelers out trying to find more buntings that are staying here over the winter. So we can kind of look into that. In 2022, um, we increased our number of um, sites from just Airly Gardens and Carolina Beach State Park to um, some people's yards. Uh, we were down at Bald Head Island and we were up in Porter's Neck in addition to those other sites. We helped researchers from Georgia put on modus tags for 12 painted buntings from Porter's Neck down to um, Bald Head Island. And uh, we also did some public education demos through that year. And then this past year, 2023, we increased our sites again. We actually had funding to pay people to work for us. So we were able to increase the sites that we went to um, considerably. We started working with the um, North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve, so the NUR, um, <laughs> uh, on Masonboro Island, down, down at Bird Island Reserve, looking at how many buntings they have on their properties. We were also doing that at Fort Fisher State Recreation Area, and we added that element into what we were already doing at Carolina Beach State Park. So we're doing educational banding of these birds, and then we're also trying to dig a little deeper into where they are. And we're hoping that in the future we can leverage that to try to get some more funding from the state or from other organizations to start digging into that nesting phenology and nesting success that I talked about during the last slide. Um, we were also super lucky this year um, as part of our getting to pay people program. Um, 
we had a field inclusive intern. Has anyone here heard of the organization Field Inclusive? <laughs> Just Nancy. <laughs> um, field Inclusive is an awesome nonprofit started by a couple of um, students at NC State. Their focus is on safety and inclusivity for um, historically excluded students in field work. So um, together, we split the cost of this intern and um, Field Inclusive got their money from the Wilson Ornithological Society, which is really, really prestigious. So um, she came down here, her name's Sophia. She is a Peruvian student who is just now entering her senior year at Wingate University. She wants to be a field biologist. So she got to come down here for the summer and work with us on our paint and bunting project. And um, she was awesome, she was so good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're gonna be a field biologist, it's great. Um, but we were really, really lucky to pre be able to provide her free housing, um, which is something that uh, really allowed her to come down here. We were paying her every month, so she was getting a salary, but that would have been entirely used up on rent, and then maybe some, if we weren't able to provide her that housing. So um, she may not have been able to come otherwise. And, uh, our housing resource <laughs> is only going to be around for another year. So we're hoping to really make the best of 2024 <laughs> um, and keep, keep on the ground looking for more places. Again, if anybody knows anybody, you can tell me. <laughs> another one of our programs is Hummingbirds. Um, who loves hummingbirds? <laughs> Everyone. They're amazing. It's, uh, they're, you know, I'm a bird nerd, so forgive me, but I just, every time you see a hummingbird, you're like, wow, that's amazing, every single time. Um, they're so cool. So one of our co-founders is a woman named Susan Campbell. She's been banding hummingbirds in North Carolina since 1999. Um, she mostly focuses on wintering hummingbirds. Um, believe it or not, we have hummingbirds that stay here all winter, especially along the coast. Um, so. Keep your hummingbird feeders up, everyone. They um, will stay here all winter. Like some of the hummingbirds that breed a little bit farther north from here will come down here and stay the winter where our summertime hum hummingbirds will potentially go farther south. Um, something that we can verify through banding of hummingbirds. Um, they have super strong site fidelity. They're amazing. But uh, Susan's work, because she's working with such charismatic animals, um, she gets to do a lot of educational um, programs and uh, it works, it's really great. When I did this video, it might, it might glitch out. Oh, it worked, great. <laughs> um, very fast, but it's just a little kid getting to release a hummingbird, which is such a memorable experience, you know? Like, that is like a child physically interacting with nature in a way that they maybe wouldn't be able to do without a program like that. Um, our last and probably most important um, pillar program is our outreach and education. Um, it's really fun and um, obviously like rewarding reaching out to the future New Hanover County residents. Um, we do um, an annual program. Right now it's every spring, but we would like to see it be spring and fall. Um, it's called Wilmington Youth Birding. We started it in 2020 and 2021. We were at Maids Park working with after school students. And if you can throw your minds back to the forbidden era of 2020 and 2021, <laughs> it was <laughs> challenging <laughs> to get people anywhere um, regularly. Um, and Maids Park was awesome. We left some of our binoculars there permanently for them to use with their students. Um, we have about 30 pairs of binoculars that we use for this program that we got from um, Marine Quest. They wrote a grant and gave us those binoculars. So that is an amazing resource that we use for all kinds of programs, but especially Wilmington Youth Birding. Um, we have since 2022, so 2022 and 2023, been at um, DC Virgo. Do you guys know DC Virgo? Awesome school. Um, it's an all year school, so they don't have like a super long summer break like a regular school. Um, they have like three weeks off here and there. That doesn't matter. 
Um, DC Virgo does this really cool thing where they have um, enrichments. So that is where like members of the community, community groups are invited to create a program and come to DC Virgo every Friday from a, essentially like 1 to 2.15 and um, work with the same group of students every week. But it's a great way to interact with um, Wilmington youth. Um, it's set up so that you can come into the classroom and talk to students and the students sign up for your program. So you're getting kids who are already interested in what you're doing, um, which is really what we wanted. Um, it also lets you have, um, they share a staff person with you. So there's someone there who like knows the kids, off gates, day one, they can be like, hey you, pay attention. And the kids listen to them, which, you know, when you're meeting students for the first time can be a challenge. Does anyone here work with youth? <laughs> uh, I guess you're the um, Audubon version of that. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, but it's really fun. You know, you go into those events and you're just like, all right, I'm ready. And then you leave and you're on top of the world. It feels so good. Everyone has a great time. These kids know so much already about the environment. It's, it's really impressive. Um, so the last two years we worked with educators at Airly Gardens um, to provide this programming and that's been really helpful for us and it's a really great program. We also um, do a monthly uh, nature walk. It's a family focused nature walk but I mean you can be a family of one. There's no problem with that. Um, the first couple months of this we got to work with Cape Fear River Watch uh, which was really awesome. And happy to say that it has grown a bit since then. We had like a couple of families at first and now we generally have three or four, maybe more. It's really great. CJ helps out with that too. So if any of you are interested in coming or volunteering, talk to me after. Um, we're also getting ready to do a field gear donation drive. Um, when I started working in this field, I found that a lot of like the gear that you need that's not provided to you from work is like prohibitively expensive. You're like, oh yeah, I'll just get some hiking boots for $200. <laughs> and um, if you are like a freshly graduated student who does not come from a position of privilege, or even if you do, but your parents don't want to spend $200 on hiking boots for you, that's a problem. Um, some of these things are required of jobs or they're really just like a safety essential. So um, we'll be working with the students of the Seahawk um, Wildlife Society. Shauna used to be <laughs> one of them. And um, we'll be uh, doing a drive this fall so that students can pick up gear as they choose, hopefully during exam week, so they can kind of decompress and look for hiking pants that are lightly used or whatever. So as we sort of finalize some of the details on that, um, we'll be communicating more about it with the public. Um, but back to our nature walks. <laughs> um, they're super duper fun and we would love it if you guys came and joined us. They are every third Saturday at Greenfield Lake uh, from 9 to 10 a.m. Um, it's not always birds. Oh yes. How cute is this? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, we, um, it's not always birds, you know, we look at plants, we look at insects, CJ's our um, resident naturalist on that program. <laughs> so we get to see all kinds of things and we really just kind of go where curiosity takes us. Um, depending on how many kids we have, we'll do like little scavenger hunts for them and it's fun, everyone can kind of participate in that. The students or the little kids with their moms and their dads are like, okay, I need to find uh, lichen was one of them that really gave those kids some trouble, but we all figured it out as a group. And then when there's kind of like a lull and you're like, I'm hanging out with strangers, there's always scavenger hunt you can look at. Um, it's really great. It's a short walk. Uh, we usually end up kind of lingering for a little while, but um, it's, it's really nice. It's a great time. I always feel wonderful after those. The next one is uh, September 16th. I won't be there, but everyone else will be. <laughs> Um, and I really hope that you guys can join us. So now I'm going to talk about our upcoming projects. Um, okay, we're good. Um, we have some really big news. We did successfully apply for a grant to work with NOAA and the um, National Estuarine Reserve System, so nationwide. Um, there are 30 reserves uh, in the country. So we'll be working with the system to build four MODIS towers. 
that's what these things are right here. <laughs> um, in different states, we'll be going to Alaska, Mississippi, um, Rhode Island, and New Jersey to build these towers. We'll also be working within the whole system to um, build educational materials for these towers. And we'll be working with um, people at UNCW and the state uh, NER office to um, build a website with just the NER modus towers. And if you're like, what the heck is she talking about? Don't even worry about it. We'll talk about, well, actually, that's the next slide. <laughs> we also got contracted to build a tower down at Bird Island. So again, it will look kind of like this. But Bird Island is right by this really, really important inlet here where there's like a ton of migrating shorebirds. And uh, we're really hoping to learn more about them. How might we learn more about them with these towers, you might ask? <laughs> with MODIS. What is MODIS? <laughs> well, you can get your smartphone out right now and go to modus.org if you want. You don't have to do that. <laughs> um, but if you did go to the website, it looks like this. You get to like a map page. All these yellow dots are modus towers, like that picture of the tower that I just showed you. Those towers are radio receivers. So they're just listening. They got their ears on all day, every day. And um, if you can harken back to the pain of bunting uh, I showed you with the little tag on its back. Um, those are radio emitters. So those are making a little independent, like unique noise all the time. And as they sort of make their way about the world, they are alerting certain towers as they pass by that they're there. So this is the Masonboro Tower right now. And you can see the species are listed right here. And the dates are listed here. So this is, I clicked the like um, resort, so it's not showing you the very first bird it ever detected, showing you the most recent birds. Um, and it looks like the first, uh, most recent ones are uh, red knots. Red knots are chonky shorebirds that are endangered. Um, but also, there's so many cool species that just come by. Um, and it's just like a way to monitor migrations that doesn't involve recapturing birds. Because even though we talked about how important that uh, banding data is, it isn't as reliable as like literally <laughs> tracking a single individual across towers. We've already seen really interesting data come from stuff like this. We've seen birds that instead of going up or down, like you typically imagine a migration, we've seen birds that have gone across the country, which is counterintuitive and um, but, you know, you find these things that you're like, oh, we assumed this all the time because, you know, you look up, you see a bird, you see it again, you kind of feel like you know what's going on. But without tracking in this, like, really fine, detailed way, um, you don't know things for sure. You don't know that there are, like, some birds that just kind of say, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. So we're really excited to be working on these next couple of projects down at Bird Island and um, across the country. Um, we're really proud of uh, being able to start doing this work and we hope that, um, you know, it really just like strengthens us as an organization and helps us to keep doing the work that we're doing for longer. Um, if any of you are so inclined, please feel free to join us on any of these things. You can reach out to me here. I have business cards, I think. Um, <laughs> our migration banding starts this week. Um, you are welcome to join us on our Greenfield Lake Walks. You can help me with all kinds of random stuff, like fixing mist nets. <laughs> That's a tedious project that is also like mind freeing. I don't know, it's like crochet. Um, <laughs> or you can sign up for a quarterly newsletter. We just started doing these. The first one will probably come out in the next couple of days. So um, if you want to get that, let me know. And you can visit us at capefairbirdobservatory.org. We're also on Facebook and Instagram if you want to stay up to date faster. Who has questions? Yes. Where are you located? Um, we are located everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't have a facility. Yeah. But where do you, you just, how do you meet? Um, well, we meet in Zoom most of the time. Oh, we meet in person, like if we're working together. Um, we have very few people who work for us, so. Uh, yeah, like I have a home office and then we collaborate via text and Zoom and phone calls. 
uh, take advantage of everything available to us in this modern era. <laughs> are, are you looking for more locations to train your gardens? Um, potentially. It depends a lot on how many people we have to do those things. Um, ideally, we would ban painted buntings in everyone's yard. Um, but each one of those, you know, takes hours and planning and, you know. Uh, do you have a lot of painted buntings? We had five last night. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, reach out to me. I'll give you my email and then um, we can talk about, uh, you know, what you have going on. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious. You said that you had funding for binoculars. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what they were. Oh, like okay. So recommend a brand and, and field of visit. We got when we got these binoculars, we were really trying to balance um, quality and quantity. So uh, Marine Quest uh, it was like kind of at the end of the fiscal year and they were like ready to give us money. Um, so she, she bought the binoculars and, and gave them to us and a couple of field guides too. We ended up picking um, some Bushnells uh, that are waterproof 8 by 42s um, I don't know that I, I think I might have a pair in my truck I can show you if you want. They don't have like a, a name, you know, it's not like the Bushnell Tiger or anything like that. Um, but they work really well, they're durable, they have kind of like a coating. Um, we use them with kids, but of course like when you're looking for binoculars, not a lot of you guys are birders, but like you don't want to like introduce a kid to birds with trash binoculars. You want them to have a breathtaking first experience with binoculars. So you really have to shell out a couple extra dollars. Um, and so I think each one of those pairs was at the time like 70 or 80 dollars. And now I think they're like a hundred dollars each. Yeah, I know. Um, thanks Marine Quest. <laughs> And I mean, we take good care of them because we use them for a ton of our programs. We always have an extra couple of pairs at the migration station. We bring them to these Greenfield Lake Walks. So when we do the Greenfield Lake Walks, we have binoculars for just about everybody who comes. And if you've got one of those like old, huge mirrored binoculars from like the 1900s, um, <laughs> we can help you out. <laughs> you don't have to use yours. You can if you want to. Um, we're also, we applied for the landfall grant, hoping to like potentially get more money to buy more binoculars. If we could buy more and better binoculars, I would get Vortex. I don't want to hog your time, oh. but I was wondering how you coordinate, or if you do with an organization or a store like Wild Bird and Garden, that Interesting. they do bird walks around, and also how you coordinate, or what to what extent you coordinate with um, people like Lindsay Addison for the, uh, uh, the uh, Audubon Society? Uh, well, Lindsay and Jill from Wild Bird and Garden are like my besties. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Jill from Wild Bird and Garden is a co-founder of the observatory. So um, I collaborate with her on my phone. Um, it's, you know, this is, she loves doing the bird store. It's a passion of hers. She feels great about it. But she also wants to just grow bird awareness and conservation in the community. And um, she's somebody who has visited Cape May Bird Observatory, which is like a really famous one sort of up in New Jersey. Um, She's visited them for a long time. She's always had sort of ambitions of um, creating her own. Um, so she's involved. I mean, the bird walks that you, if every organization in this town was doing bird walks, it would be a win. Like, we want feet on the ground, eyes in the skies. And um, everybody <laughs> should be going out looking at birds because then we have more engagement of the environment all over the place. Um, and with Wild Bird and Garden, um, you know, their bird walks, they have sort of like an established cadence of bird walks that they like to do. Yes? I guess it was interesting. I didn't know that you did all the thing with the guy. I guess I learned Wild Watch where a bird observatory was today. Great. I said, so if you, were, if, if you ever got to a step where you're doing, um, like, getting a site, what would, you, what would a good bird observatory site be? <sighs> We're still figuring that out. <laughs> um, a lot of the bird observatories are located kind of at um, 
like bird migration hotspots. So along the Great Lakes, um, in the um, Delmarva area, along mountain ranges. Um, if you're not familiar, there are uh, flyways um, in the continental United States. So there's the Pacific Flyway and the Atlantic Flyway where birds continue, like they're like migration highways. And then there are internal along mountain ranges. So a lot of bird observatories are located based off of that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Who maintains all the, the data from the different observatories? USGS or is there a private system? Yeah, yeah. I mean, usually they'll have their own internal database, but yes, like you, when you get bird bands, you get them from the USGS. And it's like a heavily permitted process. So you have to apply for a permit and you have to qualify for a permit. And then you uh, have certain species that you're allowed to even work with at all. And you have to apply for different things. Like if you want to take blood, you want to take feathers, you want to catch them in mist nets, you want to catch them in different kinds of traps. You have to apply for each one of those kinds of things separately. And um, so it's heavily regulated and you are required per your permit to make sure your data is entered by a certain time. Yes. Um, it varies. Um, so the ones that we build on barrier islands are usually like kind of short compared to some of the other ones. They're also impermanent so that we can just kind of yank them if there's going to be a really big storm. So they are set in the ground with like a short anchor and then they're anchored to the ground with um, guy wires. And uh, they're about 20 feet tall um, and they're powered by solar panels and marine batteries. Yes? Uh, I'm just really interested in heads. Oh, yeah. Do you want to look at one? Yeah, yeah. Do you have like, pictures? I have straight up modus tags. Okay. I'm just interested in how they, uh, so if they put out their own radio signal, they're going to be a battery. Yes. Within the tag somewhere. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. <laughs> Two hundred dollars. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a battery in there. Not like double A, but um, yeah, there's a lot of really intense engineering that goes into those tags. There are only like a couple of companies that you can order such equipment from, and a lot of them do their engineering and development in house. Um, It really depends. It depends a lot on uh, like the weather. It depends on the height of the tower. So if you have a clear day and a tall tower, I think it's like 20 kilometers. Um, but I think the average is like five. Five kilometers. Yeah. Yeah, it's still pretty good. So we've done like different work, like myself personally as a biologist, not necessarily always with the observatory, with different kinds of tags. And um, depending on the bird's behavior, you can have like different results in your tags. So um, I studied seaside and salt marsh sparrows who famously like, like to hang out on the ground of the marsh. Um, <laughs> salt water, not great for tags, uh, <laughs> but we, we got some good ones. And the closer they hang out in the ground, the harder they are to pick up by some of those things. So you really only catch them like if they come up and then fly a long way uh, for migration essentially. Uh, same thing is true for painted buntings. Um, I tagged, I put a modus tag on one painted bunting on Masonboro Island, um, and we didn't detect her for like the rest of the time she was like hanging out in her habitat until she was ready to migrate. And then she just went floop and right on down the coast, and she was detected by like five different towers. Um, but still really cool. Um, yes and no. Um, right now we kind of train as like an ad hoc, uh, like we need you to help and you want to learn and so we can slowly like train you to do that. Ideally in the future when we have um, a more robust staff we would like to be able to offer uh, like consistent trainings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how many people Um, we have a couple, of, we've got 
five or six people locally who already know how to do this. Um, some of them are like resource professionals, uh, like John Carpenter, I think you guys had him come talk about the Atlas. Um, he does a lot of bird banding, um, and he has had some seasonal technicians over the years who have been living here who've helped. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a couple of other people who have done bird banding for like their education or just as a job who come and volunteer for us. Third question, <laughs> would it be beneficial to have more people trained? Do you want to do this? <laughs> well, I'm curious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you like to work with gators. I'm, 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 uh, did you say gators? Oh, 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 gadgets. Ah. <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm going to re-engineer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're not really in the tag developing business, um, but if you like to work with very small things and you're interested in learning about how to band birds. Um, yeah, I mean, I know they're quite delicate. You know, yes, yes. Birds. Yeah, you really just don't want to smash them. You just, <laughs> just, a, a, just a light touch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, there are other local organizations that are also doing banding. Um, organizations, no, not necessarily. Um, Audubon, North Carolina, does um, banding, but they are mostly focused on shorebirds and um, like beach birds. Like they band um, pelicans, uh, black skimmers, and um, royal and sandwich terns. Um, and then there's. Um, Ray Danner at UNCW, who's an ornithology professor, um, his students will occasionally be working on um, projects where they will be banding some birds. Um, in the state, there are a couple other groups, um, like the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, they do um, some regular banding uh, at Prairie Ridge and then also at a spot up in um, the Uaries. And then there um, is an organization called um, Wild, wild something. Uh, they work at the Arboretum in uh, Asheville, and they do um, consistent migration banding and, and summertime stuff too. Yeah. Um, when you folks are doing banding, are there opportunities to help with it, doing other things than just putting the bird, band on the bird? Yes. Most of the other stuff is stuff we need help with. <laughs> um, yeah. So if anybody here is interested in volunteering to help with uh, migration banding or anything else, um, I have a sheet of paper. You can come up here and just like jot down your email. This is, uh, not a very um, elegant <laughs> way to do it, but it'll work. <laughs> um, should we? Oh. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'm trying to back up and get a bigger picture here. So it, you, you must have an elevator pitch. If you have 30 seconds of somebody's time uh -huh. and say, why are we doing this? What am I proving? Uh -huh. I know fire ants are moving further north. I know armadillos are moving further north. What are we proving? What, what are well, I don't know that we're proving anything. Um, but we are doing important monitoring. So. I think in order to prove something, you have to set out with a question. You have to say, what is happening with X? And how can I answer that question? But if you are just looking to see what's going on, which is what we're doing, um, yeah. yeah, we're observing, we're monitoring, we're checking, we're following. Um, I would argue that this is important work, whether we prove anything or not. Um, we want to know what's going on with our birds. We love birds. So you're part of the broader network of observatories really working cooperatively across the country to do this. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't have a lot of like on the ground connections with anybody. Well, a little, a few people here and there, but we're working on that. Mm -hmm. But you're, do, you're doing the same procedure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That the other, other observatories do. Mm -hmm. so yeah. A consistent view yeah. of birds across the country. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And there's, if you can think back to that map I showed you of the observatories, um, we're kind of in like a hole right here. Um, the closest observatories to us, there's one um, just north of us in Virginia. There's one to the west of us, um, just across the border in Tennessee at Big Bald. And then there's another one in, um, I think it's Troy, South Carolina. Um, 
And they're all doing important work. We are communicating with the other people who are doing similar work, though not through an observatory in North Carolina. Um, but yeah, like we, we want to make a difference. We want to be tracking what's going on with birds. So this is how we think is the best way to do it. Yeah? The process of catching, scanning, releasing, how stressful is it to bird and is there fatality risk? Um, fatality is variable. Um, it could depend on lots of things like um, weather, experience of the bander, um, species. But generally, the average mortality of mist netting is between 0.3 and 0.1%. Uh, um, and then there are studies that have tested uh, how stressful it is by um, taking blood samples right away and looking for cortisol levels. And I mean, it's stressful, yeah, it's stressful. If you got plucked up out of the sky by an alien, it would be stressful. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we process them very quickly and then we send them on their way. Um, we try not to have birds in the hand for more than five minutes. Um, and we haven't had any fatalities and we've only been around for a short period of time, but um, you know, uh, it's, it's, people have been banding birds since the 1800s. So um, it's a tried and true method. Uh, it does not always go perfectly, of course. Um, like any animal trapping, there's going to be potential um, maiming. How many birds have you banded? Lots. This summer alone, we banded a little over 250 painted buntings, um, which was really cool. Uh, Susan's probably banded hundreds of hummingbirds. Um, we've banded a few hundred birds over our migration banding seasons. Um, I don't have an exact number of all of them, have but yeah, roughly that. Owls? No, we haven't banded any owls. Um, owl banding is something we're interested in. Um, the work that we're doing right now is kind of like at our like top productivity. Um, but over time, as we are able to hire more people and um, work on more projects, we want to do um, saw wet owls. Um, they're known to be here along in the coastal plain, and um, it's kind of understudied about where they are, when they're here. So we'd like to do that. Um, and then I think there's other like birds of prey that we could be looking into as well. Yeah. Okay. How do you get close enough to them to capture them? We trick them. <laughs> um, so we use mist nets, which are um, thin nylon mesh nets that are in like a series of uh, pockets. So we string them across areas in the habitat where the birds normally hang out, like um, in like a, an edge, say, where there's nothing and then some shrubs. So we'll get birds who like want to go into the shrub or um, you know, something like that. But we use mist nets mostly. For painted buntings we use um, mist nets sometimes. We also use a feeder trap since they are so reliable with um, their white millet feeders. We can just put a trap around a feeder and they're like la la la, <laughs> close the door. <laughs> That's kind of also how you get hummingbirds too. Um, so trickery is the answer to that. <laughs> and then you had a question as well? Um, I was just Mm -hmm. um, so are you talking about eBird? Yeah. We don't really interface with it very much, although um, at times we have pulled information from eBird. Mm -hmm. um, Do you provide information to them? They pull a lot of information like from those databases, yeah. Like we don't have to interact with eBird at all, but um, they can look at banding data and then cross-reference it with like the um, community science that they get from eBird. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, they're pulling from a ton of stuff. Also, Cornell knows everybody. Yeah. So <laughs> they're always talking to researchers. So the towers that you showed that picture of, mm -hmm. and all of, they also have maps just like that. Are you using the same towers, or do you all have different towers? Um, OK, so are you talking about the map that was on that web page I showed you? Okay, that is like the MODIS network. That's all the towers that are in the MODIS network. What we're hoping to do with the NUR is just pull the towers that are from the NURs like all around the country. 
and make them in an easier to find area. So like if you go to that map, it's it doesn't always tell you like in a way that makes sense who owns or runs or administers the tower. And um, like unless you know exactly like where you're looking and what like keywords to see, um, it can be kind of difficult to navigate that Modus website. And they're working on making it a little bit more user friendly. Um, but if you were somebody who was working with the NERS, like you wanted to look at some of their data about, um, they collect a lot of um, like water monitoring data. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to pull that data and then you also potentially wanted to pull data from like their towers, it would be easier if it was just all together in one place instead of being like, um, I think there's one in Costa Washington and you know. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to make it easier and streamline that. And that's it. Thank you.